So in this video, I want to emphasize that what we experience from a sound is not entirely determined just by the frequencies present in that sound. So we're going to see examples where we hear frequencies that are not present in a sound, and we'll see examples where we hear different things from the same, exactly the same sound, depending on the context. And so the reason that this is all possible is that hearing is more than just about what hits our ears <clears throat> and even what goes from our ears to our brain. The brain plays a really important role in processing everything and interpreting the various uh, signals that it receives. And so if you remember, the basic mechanism of hearing, it involves these sound waves coming to our ears. The eardrum vibrates in response to the pressure variations in the sound waves. And so the motion of the eardrum is a, basically the same as the displacement versus time of the air molecules in the, in the sound wave. That motion of the eardrum is transferred to some vibrations of these bones and then uh, some waves that travel through the fluid of the, of the cochlea and also waves on this basilar membrane. And so eventually what happens is that then the various regions of the basilar membrane get excited in response to the various frequencies that are present, the various pure tone frequencies that are present in the sound. And so we send these signals along nerve fibers. If a certain region on the basilar membrane is vibrating, uh, then the nerve fibers in that region will send signals, send some electrical signals to the brain. And so those are basically just, you can just think of those as little packets of information um, and the information there is just what is the rate of firing? How quickly are these little electrical packets going to the brain? And also exactly when do those go from the ear to the brain? So there are actually some interesting, um, interesting bits of information that would be more than just how often is the neuron firing? Uh, one of the things that happens is that in the inner ear, the hair cilia go back and forth in response to the sound waves. And it turns out that the neurons tend to fire when the hair cilia are moving one way, but not the other way. And so what that means is that this firing of neurons is actually kind of in sync with the sound wave, with the displacement versus time of the sound wave. So there's a little bit of information there that the brain can use. And then also just the information about how much firing is happening for the various nerves that respond to all the various frequencies. And so I am not an expert in neuroscience, but I've gleaned the following basic picture that is you know, probably not entirely accurate, but gives you an idea of the processing that would go on. So the information coming in from your ear, originally there would be like some low level processing just to extract some of the more obvious features from that information. So what are the pitches present? How loud is the sound? Um, this could be compared against our memory of hearing other sounds to identify the, the timbre of the sound. And so obviously then our memory is going to remember some of the recent sounds that we've heard. So if we're hearing a melody, we can remember various previous notes and then we can put those together. And so once we've extracted these basic features, then there's this higher level processing that goes on that recognizes the patterns in the sound. Is, is this a melody that is going up or down? What intervals are present? Are there, are there chords present? And this is also going to be, this processing is going to happen in the context of all of the previous music that we've experienced and that we've heard. So we, we would recognize little bits of music and uh, that would go into how we interpret or experience it. And then of course we are aware that hearing music can lead to emotional responses, 
makes us feel particular ways. And so that's some very high level processing that takes everything into account and probably also combines that whatever we're hearing with what we're seeing and, uh, and sensing. Okay, so the main point of all that is that there is a bunch that goes on after your ear is finished doing its work and after these nerve fibers have sent their signals to the brain. And so this ends up leading to a bunch of interesting effects. And so for the rest of this video, I wanna talk about certain, what I'd call auditory illusions that it's almost like our brain is tricking us into, into hearing things um, that aren't there or hearing different things from the same sounds. Uh, so the first couple of illusions I want to show you uh, have to do with hearing pitches that, that don't correspond to frequencies that are present in the sound. So, uh, so this is like our, you might think of this as our brain as filling in the gaps, as sort of recognizing some pattern and then filling in the gaps, putting in sounds uh, for in our hearing that aren't actually there uh, because it's what we maybe expect. So here's the, the first one that I wanted to show you is a demo where what you'll hear is a rising pitch. And then at some point you'll hear a little bit of static as well. And so I'll just play that for you and then I'll play it again after I tell you what to look out for. Okay, so here it is. one more time there okay so so what I want you to look out for this next time is whether that rising pitch is actually continuously rising or not and so it turns out that when you hear that static the other pitch stops and so it's really a discontinuous set of three different musical pitches interrupted by these breaks in static. But at least to me, um, I can hear the pitch rising continuously. And so this is an example of, of sort of my brain filling in the gaps. So see if you see if you agree with that. Let's play it one more time. Okay, well, that was actually two more times. Uh, there's another there's another one that uh, is very common of of us hearing things that aren't really there in terms of the basic frequencies and so what i want to do is uh, is play play a tone for you and so i'm going to play uh, so this is a 180 hertz tone <laughs> And now what I'm going to do is play another tone on top of that. And the next tone is going to be higher. So what I'm going to play on top of that is this. And so what I want you to listen for is the, the combination of those two tones and see what they sound like to you. So here we go. I'm, let's, let's do it first um, where I... I'll put both of them on and then I'll turn the volume on. So what did you hear? I heard basically one low tone that was lower than either of the frequencies that I was combining in order to make that. So it's pretty surprising because you have, have a note, you add a, a higher note, and then the combination of them is this lower note that you hear, and that lower pitched frequency is not actually there. Uh, let me just, I'll just hum the note that I hear just so you can see if you hear the same thing. Okay, so, so let's 
just now, it, 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 I'll play the first note and then I'll turn on the second note so you can hear, uh, hear that original tone and then hear the second one coming on and see whether it sounds the same as before. Okay, so here's the original note and the new tone. So it was interesting, at least for me, when I heard that second tone coming on, at first I could hear it on top of the first tone, and then after five seconds or so, I didn't hear anything, and uh, I didn't hear it anymore, and I just heard that single low tone again. Uh, so this effect is what's known as the missing fundamental, and so let's try to understand it. So in my case, actually, I didn't even do it, something as complicated as playing um, three frequencies. I just played two frequencies. So the frequencies I was playing were 180 hertz and 270 hertz. So those are the first two multiples of 90 hertz. And so I was, if, if F is the frequency 90 hertz, I was playing 2F and then 3 times F. And then I could have also played 4 times F and higher ones if I wanted with a similar effect. And what we, what we observe is that the main thing you actually hear is, is the frequency F, which is really not present. And so uh, how can we understand that? So if we go back to the original sound waves, then a way to understand what we were hearing is that you could have the three pure tones or two pure tones, it's a similar result here. If you add those up, then you get a wavelet that looks like that. And you notice that the periodicity of the combined wave is the same as a 100 hertz tone. Okay, so even though all of these ones have a shorter period, if you add them all up, you get this longer period um, or a smaller frequency. And so somehow it seems that our brain is recognizing this periodicity, uh, even though there isn't really a 100 hertz sound present. And so that 100 hertz part of our cochlea is not being excited. So I think it's, it's just a, a matter of the brain being used to when, when you hear a periodic s sound uh, where the period is 100 hertz, you hear a 100 hertz tone. So in this case, we still have a periodic sound where the period is 100 hertz. It doesn't actually contain 100 hertz as one of the pure tones, um, but our brain is still used to um, hearing 200, 300, 400 hertz in the context of a pure tone that's at 100 hertz. And so we, we uh, kind of, in a, in a sense, fill in the gap and hear that as a single 100 hertz tone. Okay, so I next wanted to talk about a situation where what we hear can depend on the context. And actually, we've already had a little example of that, or at least for me, it was an example of that when I played that first tone, the, the uh, 180, and I turned on the 270. And right when I turned on the 270, I could hear both tones clearly, and I didn't hear the lower tone. Maybe I'll just do that one more time. So... There it is. So yeah, I, I definitely heard a fifth. So so you turn on the first one, then I hear heard a fifth above that first tone. And then after a while, when I stopped paying attention, all of a sudden I could only hear one tone, which is down an octave from the first tone. So that's an example of, of hearing exactly the same thing. And just depending on the context, what I was hearing up until then, I could perceive or, or, or uh, feel like I was hearing two different things. Okay, so here's another example that is, is uh, pretty fun. Um, so I want you to 
listen to this demonstration. And okay, what I'm going to do is play two tones. And then I just want you to decide whether you, the second one is higher or lower than the first tone. All right, so here we go. So the first one, second one. Okay, so that was it. Um, I definitely heard it being lower, but you might have heard it being higher. And so now I'm going to play those same two tones, but I'm going to play some tones in between them. And depending on what I play in between, you're very likely to hear the second tone to be higher in the first case and lower in the second case. So here we go. Okay, so that was to me an ascending chromatic scale and definitely sounded like the second tone, the tone I ended up with was higher than the tone that I started with. Now I'm going to use the same starting note and the same final note, but I'll play a different set of notes in between. And so that time it definitely sounded like I was going down. But again, it was exactly the same starting note and exactly the same finishing note. Okay, and so this illusion is using what are called shepherd tones. And they're, they're sort of very interesting combinations of frequencies. So the trick is that what we're hearing is not just one pure tone, uh, but a combination of them. And it's not quite the same as the usual combinations that appear in the harmonic series. So usually we have multiples of the bottom frequency. And so in this case, well, you do have multiples of the bottom uh, frequency, uh, but the bottom frequency isn't, isn't the strongest one, and the multiples are not all the multiples. They're actually just a bunch of frequencies separated by octaves. So if we look at this particular, this particular spectrum graph uh, for one of these shepherd tones, uh, what you see is that you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different octaves worth of frequencies uh, with different amplitudes. And so a really interesting that thing that uh, then happens is that if I go, just I, I keep going up the scale, um, what happens is that all of those frequencies, they shift upwards. But the amplitudes are determined by this green curve. So the amplitudes are changing as well. And if you shift all of those tones upward an entire octave. So that's, this one would go over here, this one would go over here and so forth. You get back to exactly the same spectrum as you started with. And so what that means is that we're going to perceive an upward ascending scale where the first note of the scale and the last note of the scale are exactly the same. So let me show you, let me show you this um, in in a demonstration here. So I'll get my demo cam going. All right, so here's here's my instrument. Uh, this is an app that you can, you can get. Uh, so I'm just gonna go up the scale. And so you see, I ended up in the same note that I started with. Or we can also just use the the regular major scale. And a fun thing to do is use, see, we only have seven notes. It's just one octave. Uh, but we can actually play melodies that extend over more than one octave. So a standard uh, a piano exercise for people that first take piano lessons is this one.
And so, so that extended over, over more than an octave, the highest notes um, would normally be uh, an octave and a half above the starting note, but I was able to play that and it sounded just the same as usual, even though I only have access to these, uh, to these seven notes. Okay, so to understand this a little bit better, I wanted to just show you the following. Okay, so this is this is going to be that same graph I was showing you. Okay, so this is the spectrum of our shepherd tone, and I just want to see what what it looks like um, as I ascend the scale. So here we go. So what we're seeing here is the spectrum plot for a shepherd tone. And so this is, this is showing various pure tones that are separated by an octave. And so what we'll do is animate this as we go up the chromatic scale to see how the tones change. So here we go. Okay, so you see that we're actually just right back to where we started and the even though we perceived the tone to continually be increasing we ended up getting back to the same tone that we started with okay so just to demonstrate that in one more way uh, and also to show you uh, an interesting feature of audacity that I haven't talked about yet. What I want to do is actually show you how the spectrum changes. So that was just a simulation, but let's do it for real. And so what I'm going to do is go ahead and record our ascending chromatic scale with these shepherd tones. And so Let's just get uh, get a track here set up. Okay, so what I will do here is to select, oops, I'm gonna select the spectrogram option on Audacity, and then I'll do um, spectrogram settings. And I'm gonna use a, a what's called a logarithmic scale uh, for the vertical axis. And so basically th what that does is, is it makes the, o the various octaves equally spaced instead of making the various harmonics of a note equally spaced, which would be the regular Hertz scale. Uh, we make the octaves equally spaced. And I think I'm going to go from a frequency of 80 Hertz up to 16,000 Hertz and do that. Okay, so we're ready to go here. And so now we'll make a recording of this shepherd tone scale and we'll see what it looks like. Okay, so this is a pretty interesting, so this is a spectrogram and on the horizontal axis is time and the vertical axis you see all the frequencies that are present. And so what you see is that there's um, here, there's, there's a, this 100 hertz tone at the bottom, 
uh, and then 200, uh, well, this is it's a little bit more than 100, and then double that, and then four times, eight times, uh, 16 times. So this is just a series of notes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight octaves worth of that same note. Uh, I don't know which one it was. And then what happens is I go to the next note and just all of those frequencies go up by one semitone. And then they go up again and they go up again and they go up again. And um, eventually, actually, there's, there's one that was uh, below the range of my graph that's coming in now. And what you notice is that after 12 steps, uh, you get to, so this point here, um, that note there is exactly the same as this first note that we played. You can see it has exactly the same spectrum. And so even though every single um, like specific frequency here, the next note you play, there's a higher one. So it never, it never really um, goes down, uh, but you do after 12 tones, get back to the same one that you started with. Okay, so just to, to kind of summarize, uh, what, what we learn is that our perception of pitch can be affected by context. And so, you know, our brain um, focuses more or less on certain frequencies depending on what we expect. The same note can seem to be the bottom of the scale or the top of the scale depending on what has come before it. And so just to end here, I wanted to connect with this example that you've surely heard of uh, several years ago. It was very popular to hear this one particular sound and some people heard it sound like Laurel. Some people heard it sound like Yanni. I might as well just play that for you now to see which one, which one you hear today. Um, for me, it, it just keeps changing. Okay, so here we go. Laurel. 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 All right, so at that time, uh, I definitely heard Laurel. I'm not sure if, if you heard the same thing, although if I, if I play it with the computer speakers instead, Okay, still Laurel for me. Um, so this is an, another example where what I found is I could play the, the same sound with the same speakers and just depending on the time of day that I walk into the room and play that sound, sometimes I'll hear Laurel, sometimes I'll hear Yanni. And it's just a matter of like which frequencies your brain chooses to focus on. So what I did in a video that I'll link below <clears throat> is actually just take that sound and using Audacity, I kind of filtered out the higher sounds or, or reduced the loudness of the higher sounds. And then it was clearly Laurel and it was clearly Laurel to all the members of my family. And if instead I kind of emphasized the middle frequencies of the sound, then I got a sound that was clearly Yanny to me and to all the members of my family. And then actually after that, uh, once I heard those two different versions, I could then go back to the original version and hear whichever one that I wanted to hear. And so I'll link that below so you can check it out and see if that works for you.